Okay, yeah, it's very quiet in here today. I don't know what it is. Something, Something's happened. They haven't told the rest of us. <laughs> exactly. So, we'll see. Um, we did drop the class. What's that? We did drop it. Maybe they dropped it. Ooh, well, that could be. <laughs> I hope not. No, we've almost made it now. We've got one month left, roughly, and then it's all over. So you'd be very sad. I can see your whole... That's, that's all right. It's an Einstein bagel. Yeah, those are good. I like those. I got one with peanut butter the other day. It was pretty good. This is all being recorded, so now everyone will be able to know I, I'm, made, I'm doing a commercial for Einstein bagels, and they don't even give me a discount, not even a free bagel. Should give me at least one free bagel for mentioning them in class and on YouTube. Well, anyway, uh, just a couple reminders. We are now, of course, in the final weeks. We have one month left. And we'll have our third test. Oh, we got one more coming. We'll have our third test, which will be online. I had some people, somebody anyway, emailing me. People send me a lot of emails. I have a hard time keeping track of who they all are or which class they're from. People send me emails at like, you know, 2 in the morning, and they'll say, I was looking at that quiz, and uh, something seems wrong about it. Boom. And I'll say... <laughs> Which class? What quiz? You know, they're not very specific. So then I write back and say, well, what class? And then which quiz or whatever. So keep that in mind. If you send me an email, be sure you mention which class. For example, sometimes then the guy wrote back and he said, Western Civ. I said, well, yeah, I've got two, two in, the, in the classroom and I've got one online. So again, that doesn't help me a lot. But uh, I, try, I try to answer. So anyway, we will take, somebody sent me an email and wanted to know about the test. The test, it's not a final. They want to know, do we have a final? I said, well, sort of. We don't have a final because it's a third unit test. But we're going to count it like a final because they say I have to have a final. So that is our final. But it's not cumulative. I can make it cumulative if you want it to be, but I assume you don't. So it's a third unit test. So it'll be just like the others, be over the last five chapters. And again, it'll be on the Respondus online thing. Yes? Are you going to like uh, throw our test grades for The second one? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't looked at them yet. I haven't looked at the scores yet because I don't like to be depressed. So I'll look at them <laughs> later today and see how people did. And perhaps there will be a curve. I don't know. Maybe that's why nobody's here, because they know it's all over for them. So. <laughs> a verbal test. I think it'd be better. Give you a verbal test. test. No, what the heck? Well, he doesn't want. Are you trying to film me? I get so confused with the multiple choice, though. It's like, Do I you? know it's this one, but yeah. it could be this one. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's this one, but it could be this one? Yeah. Well, that's the point of a multiple choice. But I just know the answer. So if there was I feel like I get tricked. Exactly. That's oh, what no. I, mean. so I would I never could, trick you. I could just Yeah. We're going to stick with the multiple choice. And I'll just write an essay about what it is. Yeah, you can write an essay. Write an essay? You'd rather have an essay? No. I'm not. She's a mess. Stop. She's fine. Okay. All right. I'm getting conflicting reports now. Well, yeah, I'll look it over and uh, we'll see. Yeah, don't forget Charlemagne test. What is, what, what chapters what? was that? Charlemagne? Yeah. Charlemagne is, is the, it's, it's online. It's, a, it's an original document, right? You click on it and read it. The Life of Charlemagne. You don't, you don't know where that is? Look on My Fire. Okay, I'm on it right now. Look on My Fire. And look for a link, say under the syllabus. Look under the syllabus for a link. If it's not there, let me know, but it should be there. I'm, I'm pretty confident it's there. And what you do, you just click on that, 
and it, you know, it'll open up, I think it's a PDF file, and it's about, I don't know, seven or eight pages long. Yeah. Under under required readings, okay. Yeah, check under required readings, and then what you do is you just you know you can print it out if you want, or you can just read it online. And the questions are drawn from that, and you know you might want to review some things about Charlemagne, which is probably chapter, I think it's chapter eight. In your textbook, has a little bit about Charlemagne. So the questions are going to be about really drawn mostly from that document. What sort of places did he, you know, what did he do? What kind of person was he? How is he described? You know, is he? Yes? Is this, the, um, this is for the Charlemagne test, which is this week. Yeah. The document is online. I mean, it's on there under required readings. Okay. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad we cleared that up. Maybe I should send out an email, make sure everybody's clear about that. But I just did it that way so you wouldn't have to buy the book. Actually, the bookstore did have a few of the books in, The Life of Charlemagne, which maybe some people bought the book as well. What's that? Yeah, so you could just use it that way or you can read it online. Okay? So that's what we have coming up this weekend. And I'll look over the test and see... And I don't know the rest of the rest of the people. I don't know. I guess they're perhaps they have given up the ghost, as we used to say. <laughs> they're no longer with us, but they're in a better place. That's what we used to say. They're in a better place. All right, let's get started now. We will leave the the death and destruction of the black plague behind us. If you weren't here on Tuesday, and most of you weren't, you'll want to watch the, uh, the or listen to, or whatever, view the uh, YouTube about the Black Death. That's usually some of people's favorite. They say they don't like that kind of stuff, but then they usually like to hear about other people dying. Yes? What is the problem? The bubonic plague? The bubonic plague or the Black Death? Yeah. So you can listen by it. But the Black Death, because actually people would rupture their blood vessels... And it would, they would get black and blue, so they have a lot of around their neck and stuff. Anyway, that's when people would see that blackness to their skin or that bruising to their skin, that's how it kind of got the nickname the Black Death. And the bubonic plague is a more technical name for it. Yes? And that was caused by the, the pest, right? It's, yes, it's caused actually by a bacteria that's carried by a flea that's carried by a rat that was carried by the Mongols. Well, they followed the Mongols across the Silk Road. But now I'm giving all the lecture from Tuesday, so you'll have to go and listen to it. Okay, now we've got to move on. We're moving on to the Renaissance. Wait! There's someone else. She decided to join us. That's good. Come on in. We won't embarrass you by pointing out that you're here now. Okay, good. Renaissance Italy. Let's take a look at that. Remember, this is following up this period sometimes called uh, the plague, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, um, where Europe loses between a third to a half, roughly, of all the people in Europe. It starts in the southern part of Europe and works its way north all the way through Scandinavia in about three years. And so what that means then is that in the south, it got hit first by the plague. It's the south that gets the uh, recovery first. Okay, So, the Renaissance then will begin in Italy. Why? In part because Italy was the first, it was recovering from uh, the plague earlier. Many people consider this to be one of the greatest periods of history in Europe. I think that's fair to say. Many people compare it to classical Greece, if you can remember. If you go on what I call the Wayback Machine to January or February. Seems like so long ago. We were talking about ancient Greece and the 5th century Greece with all the great architecture and philosophers and thinkers and so forth. 
Uh, they, people compare it to that time in Athens, this time in Italy. It's a rebirth. If, if Renaissance means rebirth, rebirth of what? Rebirth of Greco-Roman culture, Greco-Roman values, art, architecture, literature, so on. So, um, and really, you know, we've been talking about most recently the Middle Ages. Some people call it the Middle Ages. So the Middle Ages then um, are in the middle of what? They're in the middle between these two great periods. So, I mean, even calling it the Middle Ages is sort of dismissing it, right? So we had this great period called the Greco-Roman times, and then we got this great period called the Renaissance, and then we got this period in the middle. It's the Middle Ages, or the medieval world, or some people even have even called it in the past the Dark Ages, which most people don't use today. Because, you know, there was a lot going on then, but um, many people didn't, uh, didn't, didn't go with it. Well, let's take a look then at... Uh, what are some of the trends in the Renaissance? I put up this picture here. It's a banker and his wife. There are a lot of things here on the table that shows what they wanted to convey about themselves. So let's, let me talk about a few of those things. First of all, you can see on the table is money. This guy's got a lot of money. He wants to make sure. You see, what happened here is that he... I assume he, they, hired someone to do this painting. You know, somebody didn't just decide to paint them. They hired somebody to do this painting of them. So that means it's all staged. This is, it's, this is sort of like uh, a, a, a Renaissance selfie. Okay, When you take selfies of yourself, hence they're a selfie, you know, it seems to me if there's more than one person in the picture, it's no longer a selfie. It's now a, a two-y or a, or a groupy or something. I mean, it's, you know. But anyway, I notice when people do that, I'll be walking, like, say, down the, down the path here, the Prado, as they call it, and all of a sudden I'll see somebody just change everything, you know, and they'll, like, smile, get a lot of energy, boom, and they take a picture, and then it's like, hmm. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's like they're going along like this, and they go, and they go back like this. So in other words, the selfie is staged, and, and you even try to stage it so that something is in the background that you want to you know, show how great you are, how much fun you're having, or whatever it is, you know, like the Eiffel Tower's in the background, right, or I don't know, some famous person or... Something like that. Okay, so they're staged, right? A lot of artwork is staged, right? It's not reality. We get the sense, we, we get the feeling more that it's real, I guess, because we can do it and it's sort of instantaneous. But still, if you think about it, what you leave out of the picture and what you put into the picture is all sort of set up, right? And if and that's why people do more than one selfie, because they don't like the way they looked in one of them, or this, this thing wasn't framed in their right, or it didn't get the whatever it was that you were supposed to get out of the picture. Well, think about this. This is sort of a selfie, because they hired somebody to paint this, and they have staged it very purposely so that we will think certain things about them. One of them is that they're extremely wealthy. They got a lot of money. They're flaunting it by the clothes they're wearing. The clothes that they're wearing, that's one way we could start. We spent a lot of time analyzing this picture that way. We're not going to spend a lot of time, but I just want you to think about it a little bit. The clothes that they're wearing shows that they're wealthy. The kind of hat he's wearing, the kind of you know, dress she's wearing, the cloak that he's wearing. Then take a look. She's holding a book. Books are very expensive. Most people did not have books. And take a look at this book. It is illustrated. It has color illustrations in it, color plates. That means that was hand-painted in that book because there was no way to just, you know, run it off of a machine. So this book was, was hand-painted. 
extremely expensive. And then uh, notice that he's counting money, right? He also has uh, some gizmos. You know, this would be like making sure his iPhone was in the picture or something. He's got expensive toys and gizmos of his day. He's got money, so much money, he's just kind of casually looking at it and stacking it up. Unlike me, you know, I never see any money. Theoretically, it goes into my bank account, and then theoretically it comes out of my bank account, and when I look at it, there's just nothing there. Right? But this guy's got stacks of money. Look back in the background. On the shelf, he's got expensive stuff just sitting around on a shelf. First of all, he's got a house with shelves. And then he's got all kinds of stuff on there. Look at a nice pottery, you know, plate. He's not really not even using that plate. It's just there for decoration. That's how wealthy he is. And all this other stuff that's there. Then take a look at the very carefully placed photo frame, right? We call it photo picture, picture frame that's there that is probably gilded. That means it's probably wood with some gold foil on it. And it has a domed glass cover. You can tell by looking at it. And notice what's reflected in it, a window. That means they, they are living on the ground floor and they've got a window. Very expensive. That means they live in an expensive house, they have expensive things, they're wealthy enough to get somebody to do this painting of them. So all of this is about them. In medieval times, as I ended that talk Tuesday, I said in medieval times, people didn't focus on them. They focused on God. They focused on being sinful and so forth. In the Renaissance period, people are going to focus on themselves. They're going to focus on other humans and how creative they are. So humanistic values then are individualistic. Individualism. We ought to be well accustomed to that. If there's one thing our society is today. It's all about me. Right? It's individual. I'm an individual. I'm not like anybody else. I'm special. I'm like a little snowflake. Right? Every snowflake that comes down is unique and beautiful. Just like me. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, you're, you're special and so forth. This is what we do. And, I mean, even the idea that we would have our own Facebook page, it's all about me. Instagram page, it's all about me. I know that you're very interested in everything I do. I woke up this morning, what I ate for breakfast. Here's a picture of it. Here's where I'm going today. Here's what I'm doing. Don't you wish you were me? I mean, that's what a lot of it is, right? It's, it's not exactly humble or modest, right? But that's what, you know, that's what modern society is. And I'm just, I'm just making a commentary. I'm not, uh, you know, criticizing people. I'm just saying that's the way it is. So we ought to understand this. This is what they were moving towards. We're going to have this painting of just us. The focus of this painting are these two people, a banker and his wife, what they have, what they're doing, how important they are, how special they are. Now, also during this time period, we have powerful political leaders powerful political leaders because we actually end up having city-states that are very powerful and each city, each city-state is ruled typically by either a single or often a group of very powerful political leaders. The other thing we begin to see is remember in the medieval world we talked about feudalism or the feudal system if you remember that, I think it was last week, and how everything was delineated by your birth, right? You were born a peasant or born to a certain family, and you really weren't going to be able to change that for year after year, for hundreds of years, actually. You were tied to your social class. It was, you know, there was not social mobility, which is sort of the American dream, right? That, you know, this... This kid that was poor and grew up poor and rises up and becomes, uh, you know, a great political leader or something. That's the American dream, and certainly I still think that's 
able, we are able to accomplish that here, a lot more so than anywhere else in the world. But that was, that was not true in medieval times, but in Renaissance, it was beginning to change. We're beginning to see a rise of what we could call the middle class, or in French, they call it the bourgeois, bourgeoisie. These are the middle class. Basically, how this happens is, and, and this goes all the way back even to the Greco-Roman times, we had the social classes and social orders, is that you had, say, in the medieval times, uh, nobility who did not want to get their hands dirty doing business. See? I'm the duke of whatever. I don't buy and sell things for profit. That's just beneath me. You see? I just have my money and I have my privilege and you pay me money because of who I am. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, that's too much like work or something. It's, it's beneath me. And so you had a lot of people then who got involved in business of various kinds and they made a lot of money. But they didn't have any political power. But we start to see in this Renaissance period that begins to change. The pe like these people, these people are really, I guess we'd say, middle class. They're not nobility. They're technically peasants, but they're not living like peasants. And they want to make sure you know that, right? You may call me a peasant technically, but I'm no peasant, see? I've got a nice house. I got windows in my house. I got gold laying around. My wife's got an illustrated book. We're wearing fancy clothes. We drive a BMW or whatever. Whatever you prefer, I don't know, Mercedes or something. So, you know, we've got a lot of money. So this middle class is growing. Now, the other thing we're going to see, and again, these are just trends in the Renaissance period. Changes from the medieval world into this world. Great artwork. I'm not saying there wasn't any good artwork in the medieval times. There was some, but there's going to be a lot more, a lot different sort of art. What many people believe is the pinnacle of art paintings, and that sort of thing, come from this Renaissance period. And I, you know, I like a lot of it myself. It's a little flowery for me, but, you know, it's, but it, you know, it's there. There's a lot of it, some great stuff. Okay? I think that's it for this slide. Yep. Now, the other thing that we see here during the Renaissance period, like I said, are strong political leaders, and these leaders are princes. They take on the title of a prince. That's usually what they're called. These princes are very important because they're not only involved in politics, they are political leaders, but they're also economic. You know, we might call them a tycoon, right? A business. Uh, they've made a lot of money in business, but they're also involved in politics. They're also involved in what we might call social and intellectual pursuits, perhaps studying things, maybe even writing books or um, being scholars, what we might call scholars. They also throw grand parties, by the way. Everybody wants to come to their party. Speaking of everybody wanting to come to a party, don't forget, you're invited to my house. When? April the 21st. Let me double check that. It's a Friday. It's a Friday. Yeah, is that it? April the 21st. You can come at as early as 5.30 p.m., not a.m. And uh, you can stay as long as you like. I will be making pizzas. I make the dough. I make the dough ahead of time. We'll make the dough on Wednesday if it's on Friday. Let it sit in the refrigerator and rise slowly, and I'll make my own sauce, and then we'll have pizzas of various kinds, plus other food. Whatever, whatever you like. No cheese. <laughs> well, I, I could, I could, you know, what do you, you don't want any cheese, what do you want on it, nothing? Just the dough? I mean, I can, I can make a pizza crust. I'm allergic to cheese. You're allergic to cheese. Well, yeah. We can put vegetables on it. We could put, could put meat on it. 
We could put tomato sauce. You're not allergic to tomato sauce, right? <laughs> so we could put tomato sauce. Yeah, sure. I can make a pizza like that. That's no problem. I can custom make them. That's what I'm saying. Because I make, I make the dough. I make the sauce. Then I have other stuff put on it. So I have vegetables and I have meat, pepperoni, uh, you know, olives, stuff like that. Okay, so that's certainly doable. It's doable. I had somebody ask me if I was gonna make gluten-free pizza. I said, I don't know how to make a glue, I don't know how you make a pizza crust if you're not using flour. And they said, Will you buy it? I said, Well, okay. Maybe I can try to buy a pizza crust that's gluten-free for the person who asked me. So I try to accommodate people, but uh, yes, that is on Friday, April the 21st. And if you're, you're definitely welcome to come. I had one at the beginning of the semester and nobody came. Well, nobody from these classes, other people came. The people who had been there before came because they want to come back and get more pizza. But I can make a cheeseless pizza. Why not? Sure, I don't have to put cheese on it. I guess it'd be good. Yeah, it'd be good. It depends on. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Well, you know, I mean, it'd be like eating sort of like breadsticks with tomato sauce. Well, that's actually pretty good. Some oregano. <laughs> we could put other stuff on there. We could put some pepperoni on it, or we could put. Uh, I I usually get the bacon. You know, the crumbly bacon stuff. Sometimes I put that on there, too, if people want it. So I make meat lovers. I make vegetable ones. I make cheeseless, sure. I made a Hawaiian pizza. I get, some people requested the Hawaiian pizza, and other people uh, protested the fact that I would even consider making a Hawaiian pizza. They were very opposed to it, like he is. See, he's opposed to the Hawaiian pizza. Why do you not like Hawaiian pizza? So I usually make one Hawaiian pizza with ham and pineapple. So I will make at least one Hawaiian pizza. I will make at least one cheeseless pizza. I will try to make one gluten-free. I think I'll just put cheese in there without any crust. That would be messy. Anyway... So these princes then would have, you know, parties, they would sponsor art, they would be military command, uh, commanders, they would be economic, tycoon kind of people, bankers, they would be politicians, and they would be patrons of the art. So why do we have all this great artwork? It's because somebody paid for it. Typically, artists don't make much money, right? Down through the ages, a lot of artists have died poor. Some of them bankrupt or, or, you know, starving artists. You've heard the term starving artists, haven't you? Because, you know, they don't make much money. And a lot of times when people finally figure out they like their art, the guy's already dead. So, you know, thanks. Didn't do me much good. But what these guys do, these princes, is they will actually recruit artists, bring them to their city, put them up you know, nicely, feed them, take care of them, and just have them make art all day, which is what artists really want to do. They don't want to mess with all that business stuff, to be honest with you, most of them, true artists. They just want to make art. So we get lots of great art, a uh, lot, lot of money flowing, military. Each one of these princes then had its own city-state. And on this map, it shows us these Italian city-states that we see here in northern Italy, here in different colors, centered around one main city, as you can see, right? We've got Florence, we've got Genoa, Milan, Venice, Rome. Each of these cities is not just a city, but it's a territory around the city that is an Italian city-state. And remember, one of these princes, one of these Italian princes is actually the Pope. The Pope has a city-state of Rome, which is quite large, as you can see here. What's that? Well, the Vatican is the only remnant of it today. But the Papal States 
included Rome and then all the way up the coast here to Ravenna. So the Pope actually had a large chunk of territory in central Italy. The remnant of it today, you're right, is only the Vatican. The rest of it, the Pope has lost. But the Pope is still technically a prince today, and therefore there are papal legates, that is the Pope, can, Pope sends, often sends somebody to meet with other heads of state you know, in diplomatic ways. All right? The Vatican has its own postage stamps, it has its own security, you know, its own military, it has its own government, has its own courts, has its own bank, but it's very tiny. You know, it's very tiny. Yeah? So, um, did the Renaissance uh, originate from uh, Italy? Or? Yes. Because, I mean, it's like a French word. And then... It's a French word. You're right, it's a French word. But really, it does start here. Okay. The Italian, you know, we could use the word Renaissance for anything that's a rebirth. Remember, we used it back when we talked about Charlemagne. And you remember you have the Charlemagne thing due this Sunday. There was a renaissance, a Carolingian renaissance, sometimes it's called. But really, when most people just say the renaissance, they're talking about the Italian renaissance. It starts there, then it spreads throughout Europe. So there are various states. There's the papal states by the pope. There's Florence. There's Venice. There's Milan. There's Naples. These are some of the main ones that we'll take a look at, but there are, there are others, and we're not going to look at all of them. But you can see on this map now, this northern part of Italy was divided up into several city-states, which had a lot of things similar about them. They had usually a powerful family or a group that is ruling, and uh, they, they're doing their own diplomacy, their own banking, they have their own art. So now what I want to do is I want to take a look at five, just five of the city-states briefly and highlight a few things about them. So these, these city-states are small, independent city-states. You might think about them as being like tiny countries, tiny country of, let's say, Florence. And so Florence would have its own treaties, it would have its own economic policies, it would have its own ambassadors, had its own government. So these are much like ancient Greece. You remember when we talked about ancient Greece, 5th century, 6th century, remember it was divided into city-states. So what this does is it brings a lot of competition. There's competition between these uh, states. So they're all sovereign powers, and they all have their own ambassadors and alliances, uh, military. I mean, sometimes they even fight one another in battles. I mean, actual fighting, not just business fighting. I mean, actual military conflict. And so they are very competitive. Competition, you know, some, some people don't like competition. I think competition's bad. Competition bad. But, you know, competition does, and has proved down through history, that competition does tend to uh, bring out the best results. You see? For example, if I said everybody, the first day of class, everybody in here has automatically got an A, I'd probably never see you again. <laughs> so, okay, I'll take my A. See you later. And at the end of the semester, you get an A. But if you know that you have to do certain things to get an A, all right, that's probably going to encourage you to do more things than if I just tell you right off the top, hey, everybody's getting an A. Here are the things you're supposed to do, but everybody's getting an A. And if, and if I said, and I don't say this, but if I said only two of you are going to get A's, right, a certain percent, only, you know, say, only 5% only, only, uh, will get A's, and 10% will get B's, and so forth. If I said I'm going to strictly follow that, the top two students are getting an A. That's it. Now, of course you would complain, but if there's no way out of it, I think it would probably encourage you to try to do maybe better than... Well, maybe not. 
but I think you can. Because then you'd say, well, you know, I better make sure not only I'm doing this stuff, but I better do even more if I'm on an A. Because there's only going to be, say, two or three people get an A. Well, anyway, competition. Competition. And today, you know, competition, you know, everybody gets a ribbon today. Everybody gets a trophy, right? But still, I think competition ups the game a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Like we have this basketball tournament going on right now. I think the teams, you get down there, you start off with, you know, I don't know how many teams are in it all together, hundreds of teams. You get down to like 64 teams, and you get down to 32 teams, you get down to 16 teams. Then you start having some really good games. Now, I'm not saying you don't have good games before that, but by the time you get down to just 16 teams or eight teams or now four teams, they're all good teams, and when they come to play each other, they're going to have to play really well if they want to win. Okay? So if you like watching college basketball, well, then I guess this weekend coming up would be your time to watch because if you haven't watched it any other time, you're now down to, and some people might argue, maybe they're not the four best teams, but they're four very good teams, and they're going to play each other. Well, anyway, let's move on from that. You're always getting me off on tangents. I don't know how you do that, especially when you don't say much. Some might say it's me, but of course... I don't want to say it's me. It's always somebody else. The man's keeping me down. Decline of the papacy, we also see that during the Renaissance. There's a lot of corruption. There's been a lot of power coming to the Pope. The Bishop of Rome has been accumulating a lot of power throughout the medieval world, you know, medieval times. Maybe the pinnacle of his, of his power is in the Crusades, where basically he's... He's sending armies from all over Europe to sort of do his bidding to a certain extent. But with a lot of power, there's a little saying about power. Maybe you've heard it. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You ever heard that saying? Well, if you haven't, you just did. <laughs> power does lead to corruption. People have a lot of power. They kind of think, hey, I can do whatever I want. And so we see then the decline of the papacy. There's a lot of corruption in the church. And there's a lot of, uh, it ends up being dis, disunifying. It disunified the church and created a lot of problems. One of these popes is that we see, I think this is supposed to be a drawing of him here, Pope Boniface VIII. Let's just give you an example. Post Pope Boniface VIII, you see when he's Pope, is in dispute with Philip IV, who is king of France. Right? Or France, however you want to say it. Now, remember I said long ago when I made that amazing chart that I had on the PowerPoint with the arrows and the power, and I had the the Pope, you know, is crowning the emperor, and who's, who's at the top, the emperor or the pope, the king or the pope? I said this was going to come back and become a bigger issue. Well, this is one of the times when that's a big issue. Because what the pope believes is that he has authority over the king, and the king's not buying it. What Philip was doing that got the pope upset is that he was taxing the clergy. Taxing the clergy. That just wasn't done, okay? And the Pope said, look, nobody's ever taxed the clergy. The clergy don't get taxed. The state cannot tax the church, right? The church is outside of that realm of taxation. We still have this kind of thing today. I don't know if you know it or not, but we still have it in the United States today. Churches are nonprofit organizations, right? That means they're not taxed. So that means you go down to one of these giant churches that have, you know, who knows, acres of land. They're not paying any property tax on any of that land. 
to the city of Lakeland or to the state or anybody else. There's no property tax on, on, on a church's property or on the building. You build like you know, a $5 million building. You're not paying any taxes on that building. Plus, a lot of these really big churches now, some people call them mega churches, but other churches too, get involved in all kinds of what we might call businesses. In other words, some of them have like their own bookstore and gift shop. You ever been in a church had one of those? Have their own coffee shop. Maybe have their own daycare. Maybe have their own gym, you know, like where you can go in a workout place. Maybe they have, who knows, they have their own schools. They have all kinds of stuff going on at that, on that church property. None of it's taxed. See, none of it's taxed because the church is nonprofit. So the idea is, if you do make money off of the coffee that you're selling at your coffee shop, the profits then go to the church, which is nonprofit, and they use it to carry out their nonprofit enterprises, whatever they're doing, right? Yeah. I think it's because that most churches like struggle. I mean, some don't, but it's still like, you know, well, yeah. there's a lot into it. Well, it, it, it dates all the way back to this. That's really where it comes from. It's not the idea, oh, well, churches are in trouble, so we've got to help them out. No. This goes all the way back to the idea that the government and the church have separate entities. And originally, say in medieval times, God had delegated authority to the church, and God delegated authority to the government. Therefore, the government does not have authority over the church. Okay? That's really where it starts. What the remnants that we see of it today is, for example, churches are nonprofit. They don't pay property taxes and so forth. For example, ministers get tax breaks that other people do not get. I don't know if you know that or not. If anybody in here is studying to go into the ministry, I get tax breaks you don't get because I am a minister. That means I get a housing allowance. What that means is, let's say, let's say you know, since I'm making big money here, I make say twenty thousand a year. I'm not really telling you what I make. I'm just let's just imagine I make twenty thousand dollars a year. And let's say that it cost me $10,000 to maintain a place to live. I'm talking about either rent or mortgage, utilities, uh, you know, anything I have to do to fix up my house, furnishing, furnishings for my house. All of that comes out of the housing allowance, and all of that is not taxable. So let's say I have them take out a thousand, delegate designate $1,000 a month for my housing allowance. That's to pay my utilities, my rent, my, or my mortgage, to pay for all the things for my house. And I, let's say I only make $25,000 a year. They're taking out twelve dollars for that. It means I only get taxed on $13,000. So it's like I'm making $13,000 instead of twenty-five. dollars That's called the housing allowance. So if you know anybody who's a minister who's not doing that, they really ought to be because... It's a, it's a tremendous savings. It puts you in a completely different tax bracket. But anyway, why do I have that? Why do ministers have that and other people don't have that? Because of this idea, taxing the clergy. Now, they're still sort of taxing me, but they're not taxing me at the same level. I get all kinds of deductions other people don't get. So you are a minister? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Believe it or not. She doesn't believe me now. She's like, what? <laughs> Really? Yeah, I'm ordained as a minister. I didn't know. What? I didn't know that either. Yeah, well, you know, I try to keep it secret. No. I, yeah, I, you know, I've preached a lot. In fact, in Kentucky, I had a church there, a little, little tiny church, for the same place for 11 years, out in the middle of nowhere. Very small number of people, you know, 30, 40 people, sometimes less. And at other churches as well, but that's the most recent one. Now, down here yet, I haven't, I haven't done that. I had a church that wanted me to do that. I was just too busy. I said, no, I can't do it right now. So anyway, but still, since this school is, is a church-related school, I still get the housing allowance. Yeah. And she's going, oh, really? Yeah. That, you do. 
because that's part, you know, that's, that's considered in part of uh, my em employment. If, you know, if I, if I wasn't Christian, I guess they wouldn't want to hire me. And if I'm a minister, then they think that's better than not being one. Anyway, I don't know all the legal ramifications, but I can tell you I get a, still get a housing, housing allowance. Yeah. I have a question, and I'm not familiar with the tax and stuff, but mm -hmm. in non profit organizations, yeah. it's not just church, right? No, it's not just churches. Not just churches. Other things now could be designated as nonprofit. So a charity. But in fact, if you look at it historically, most charities started from churches. Yeah. So if you were a minister and you worked for the state as well, mm. you still get the deduction. Your your employment has to be somehow related to ministry. So since the school here trains ministers. They have a seminary. Well, I guess they don't call it a seminary, but they offer like MDiv and all that kind of. They're training ministers as part of what we do, and we're church related. You have to be church related. So if you went to like a big like the USF or something, you wouldn't. Get I wouldn't get that. No, not well, not from their money. If I had other employment, I could. Like if I worked at a church, then I could. So that's yeah. Because I used to also teach night classes at a state university. There, you know, of course I was adjunct. They would just pay me and they took out the taxes and do whatever. So, yeah, it gets a little complicated because, you know, in some things I'm charged it, some things I'm not. But overall, what you do when you do your taxes, you, you figure out your overall income. And then if you have these deductions, it's not even a deduction. You know, when you take a deductions in taxes, you don't, like if you say, oh, I donate $100 to this then I get $100 off my taxes. That's not really the case. You get, if you donated, let's say, $1,000 of money over a year to nonprofit organizations, churches, and things, it doesn't mean that you're going to be in a $1,000 lower tax bracket because that's going to go in through another form of deductions, and then you just get a percentage of that reduced. It's not dollar for dollar. A housing allowance is dollar for dollar because it's pre-tax money. So, you know, like if you make it $25,000 a year, you get a $10,000 housing allowance, you're only paying taxes. It's only reported as $15,000 of in income. And then after that, you can still take deductions, you know, if you have them. If you're only making $25,000 a year, you're probably not going to have a lot of deductions because, well, you're not going to have a lot of discretionary money to be given to people, right? Anyway. Well, this was the issue then, taxing the clergy, and this is still around today. And by the way, as the church, the church is, in my opinion, under attack in the United States in various ways, under a lot of scrutiny. And I think one of the, one of the first things that's going to go someday, they won't let ministers have a housing allowance. And they won't let churches have a tax exemption. That could happen. Especially because we've got such large mega churches in big cities, they build them out by the interstate, you know, out where you would put a shopping mall or some other kind of business, and then that property doesn't generate any revenue. If the church wasn't there and somebody put in a business, then the county, the state, the t whatever, the local place would be making lots of tax money off of. If a coffee, if for example, a church has got a coffee shop, somebody else opens a coffee shop. If somebody else opened the coffee shop, the state would be getting all kinds of sales tax and other taxes. So that's some of the pressure that may well, I mean, it may well happen. It's always, it's always being sort of debated in the background. But this is really where it goes back to. It goes back to this idea that the church is somehow different than the state and it shouldn't have to pay taxes. And so the Pope says, look, clergy does not pay taxes to the state. So he issues a papal bull. A papal bull is a document. And it gets the name bull because it's sealed by a bulla, which is a, you know, they, take, they would take the document and kind of roll it up or, or fold it up. And then they would take wax and melt it on it and they would press a seal into it so that you would know that nobody had what I call monkeyed with it. Nobody had looked at it or changed it, right? It's, well, it's kind of like if you get a letter in the mail with an envelope and the envelope sealed, right? That's the idea that you seal the envelope is you don't want everybody reading your mail or going in there and changing, monkeying with it, getting your information. 
That's what this was, so they would seal it up that way. The Pope uh, declared that he had authority over the state. King didn't like that much. Right? King didn't like it much. So what happens? Who's going to win? Spoiler alert, if I tell you, see, it's a spoiler alert. Well, troubles will continue to grow. Boniface excommunicates the king, kicks him out of the church. And she's, she didn't get the last line there. You need this? Yeah. Okay. Boniface uh, kicks, the, kicks, kicks the king out of the church. He excommunicates him. Was the king upset? Well, I don't know. He probably didn't necessarily appreciate it, but he didn't really stop him. He just gets, he just gets angry. Sorry. That's all right. So he sends his troops down. He kidnaps the pope. He said, all right, I'll show the pope. Kidnaps the pope. The pope was later freed by Italian nobles, right? But the shock of all of this, the pope was shocked that he would dare come and arrest him or take him, kidnap him, and lock him up. And you know how it is. And people get shocked and you know, blood pressure goes up. And their heart blows out a valve or something. And then eventually that's what happened to the Pope. The Pope died. So now Philip IV, remember, who's French, is down there in Italy because he's having all this trouble with the Pope. And so when the Pope dies, he pressures the College of Cardinals the College of Cardinals, in the Roman Catholic Church, you have the Pope, you have the Cardinals, and you have the bishops, and then you go down to, say, the priests. So the College of Cardinals is very powerful, and typically you choose the Pope from one of the Cardinals. And the College of Cardinals are the ones who elect the Pope. So he pressures the College of Cardinals to elect a French Pope, one of the Cardinals who's French to become Pope, so that basically that Cardinal, who will now be the Pope, will be agreeable to the French king. So the French king and the French pope will now be working hand in hand. So they do. They elect the French pope. Clement V, 1305 to 1314. Yes? I'm sorry, confused. But it's French, though. So he just comes from France and then yeah. take over the... Well, what happens is the, the church has bishops from all over. So in France there are bishops, and in Italy there are bishops. Now traditionally the Pope had always been Italian. But there were French bishops who were elevated to cardinals who were on the College of Cardinals. So technically somebody who's French could have become could become the Pope. Maybe somebody who's German could become the Pope. But it has never had. It was untraditional. And it had always been sort of controlled by local politics. So he puts pressure on the cardinals. Basically, he's got an army sitting there saying, look, you should vote in a French cardinal. And there were, I think there were two or three at the time. And so they chose one of them. His name, of course, the pope takes a name after they become pope, is Clement V. He's going to serve, as you can see, from 1305 to 1314. What does he do? <coughs> Very radical. He moves the head of the church from Rome to France to a, to a town, a city called Avignon. So this is sometimes called the Avignon Papacy. So now the papacy is under the thumb of the French king. And they've even moved the center of the church power to France. And we have a French pope. So the French controlled then the cardinals because the pope gets to select who are new cardinals and so he starts stacking the deck and putting in more French bishops as cardinals to assure that when we need another pope, that pope's also going to be French. And so they start to control the vote. So it gets very political is what I'm saying. This is what I'm telling you, the papacy is declining because it's becoming a political pawn, I guess you might say. It's being very involved in the politics. All right, the Pope, his name is Clement, 1314, he dies in Rome. The people of Rome say, you know what? Uh, 
Because sometimes the Pope, even though everything's centered in France, he'd have to come to Rome because there's a lot of business for him to do there. He happens to die when he's in Rome. So the people of Rome protest, we want a Roman Pope. We want an Italian Pope. They force the cardinals to elect, again, politically, forcing the cardinals to elect a Pope that they would like. This Pope's name is Urban VI, 1378 to 1389. So he is the new pope. So when Gregory dies, see, he's a French pope, then we get an Italian pope. But however, what happens is five months later, the cardinals meet and say, you know what, we were forced to elect this person as pope. This person is not really pope because this wasn't a fair election. So they elect another pope. So now we got two popes. His name is Clement the Seventh, and then we got one called Urban the Sixth. They're both Pope at the same time. They declared Urban the Sixth election null and void, and said he's the only true Pope. But guess what? Urban the Sixth did not accept that. So now we got a Pope in Rome, and we got a Pope at Avignon. We got two Popes. Now. Basically, everyone in Europe, almost everyone in Europe, the large majority of people in Europe, are Roman Catholic. There are no other churches. So if you're Christian, you're a Roman Catholic. You may not know a lot about church theology or history or government, but there's sort of one thing you probably know. You should only have one pope. And now we've got two popes. The other thing you probably know is the popes in Rome. Popes in Rome, and we only got one pope. Now we got a pope in Rome, we got a pope in France. What's going on with the church? Obviously, there's political fighting. And, you know, even I, you know, peasant working in fields, I hear there's two popes. I know something's up. And they're both French. No, they're not both French. This guy's Italian. Uh, Urban. Urban is Italian, and uh, Clement is French, yeah. So we got one sort of Italian back pope and one sort of French back pope. Okay. So we got two popes. Here we go to make it clearer. Urban the sixth in Rome, Clement the seventh in Avignon. This is sometimes called the Great Schism. A schism means a divide. A schism means uh, you know. Two, you know, two, two people, two people, two organizations, two things divide. They divide from one into two. It's a great schism then, or division of the church. The Avignon papacy now is challenged because, you know, we've got two popes. So now what happens is, for the first time, I guess ever, you can choose your pope. See, which pope do you want to follow? Do you, want, do you like the Italian pope? Do you like the French pope? Guess what? People begin to choose which pope they're going to back, primarily based upon political reasons. All right? So now I want to warn you again. I've got an elaborate graph that I think you know, may shock you, so I'm just trying to prepare you. I don't want you to have you know, any trouble with your heart. When you see this elaborate chart that I've created to help you understand. Here it comes. Are you ready? There it is. Look. Wow! wow. Yeah, I know. Look at that. Color-coded. Little boxes. Thank you. Yes. Yes, it is pretty. Well, uh, Clement and Urban... So remember, just so you keep it straight, Urban is the Italian guy. He's in red. And then Clement is the French guy. He's in blue. Now, see what happens. Different countries decide which pope they're going to follow. France, obviously, is going to follow the French pope. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. All right? Guess what? If France is going to follow a French pope, you know England's not going to follow a French pope. They don't like the, they don't like the French. They never liked the French even back to this point. So they're going to follow the Italian pope. All right? 
Scotland is going to follow the French Pope because England is following a Roman Pope, and Scotland doesn't really like England. See how this works? So we often see France and Scotland on the same side of things because of that. Then, then we've got a Germany. Germany goes along with the Italian Pope. Spain goes along with the French Pope. And Scandinavia chooses the Italian Pope. Now what might also surprise you is that not all of Italy got behind the Italian Pope. The southern part of Italy had always been, Italy had always been divided, still today, to be honest, even though the country's unified, the people in the south part of Italy and the people in the north part of Italy do not necessarily get along very well. They say, even when I visited there, I hear them saying bad things about each other. Right? The people in the north think the people in the south are very lazy. And, you know, they don't work hard and it's like sort of milking everything. And the people in the, in the south say all these guys in the north are just, you know, too controlling. They're always trying to run everything, tell us what to do. Okay? So, so the rest of Italy, yes, but the southern part of Italy goes with the French. All right, the Great Schism, as it's called, 1378 to 1417. Here you see... Speaking of the pizza you can have at my house, this is a leaning tower of pizza. Oh, it's not pizza? Oh, okay. Well, we could try to make a tower of pizza. It would be very messy, I think. I make a lot of pizzas. I take them out of the oven, I cut them, I turn around and I turn back around again about two minutes later and they're gone. So what happened to that pizza? People will, I'll tell people, look, pizza's coming out. If you don't get there when the pizza's coming out, then you've got to wait for the next pizza. Because <laughs> I only cook one pizza at a time. That's just the way I do it. That's, it. that's the way it works. And it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get a pizza, roughly. So when, I, you know, when one comes out of the oven, I cut it up, people take it. Then I start rolling out the dough. I start stretching out the dough and making another pizza which takes me, you know, two to three minutes, and then I have to put it in the oven eight to ten minutes, and then I take it out. So it takes about ten to fifteen minutes to get a pizza. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. If you want the pizza, you got to get there and get the pizza. What time? What's that? Oh, what time is it there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting hungry now. Starts at 5.30, so I think probably the first 5.30 in the evening on a Friday, yeah. Okay. And it goes, I mean, some people have stayed till midnight or something, you know. Oh. Yeah, sometimes. Okay. It's all right. You can stay. Usually people start clearing out, you know, 10 o'clock, something like that. But, you know, the pizzas are not going to go that whole time. <laughs> I, don't, I can't make enough pizza to go like five hours. We'll probably have pizzas the first two to three hours, you know, like from 5.30 to maybe 7.30. I'll be baking pizzas until I run. Until people, usually people get full. I'll put a pizza out there, and when it's not gone in five minutes, I know I can slow down. There's pizza, pizza, and people have enough pizza. Because there's other stuff, too, to eat and drink. And I have a swimming pool, so if you want to swim, you are welcome to swim as well. If you're brave and you want to do that, that's fine. No, I mean, it's, it's there. Well, the Leaning Tower of Pizza. By the way, someday, uh, if you get to go visit here, I know what you're going to do. You're going to have, you're going to maybe try to do it yourself or you're going to get someone else to do it, is you're going to go over and you're going to stand by it, and, and you're going to oh, yeah, do this. Yeah, I've seen people I've seen do that. You ever done that? Yeah. I mean, I Pe people it. do it. I don't know how, it'd be hard to do with a selfie, because it'd be hard to know you're standing in the right you'd spot. You'd be like... You'd be like... <laughs> well, I guess you could, I don't know. But that's what everybody does when they go there. They get somebody to take their picture holding it up. So remember that when you get there, you can do that. Fine with me. Well, the great schism begins to weaken the faith. And we see dissatis dissatisfaction with the papacy on the rise, dissatisfaction with the church on the rise. Why? Because of all this corruption and all this political fighting. So they finally, there's another way to resolve some of these things. It's to have a church council. So they call together the leaders of the church, the bishops. And they say, okay, we're going to resolve this. 
in Pisa, that's why I put the tower up here, 1409, they depose both popes at that time, and they elect a new pope. So, okay, we're going to solve this. We're going to get rid of the French pope, we'll get rid of the Roman pope, we'll elect a new pope. Now, he's an Italian pope, but we'll elect him. He's a brand new pope. So, you think this solved it? It did not. They elect a new pope. Spoiler alert, the first two popes said, look, we're not stepping down. We don't recognize your authority to depose us. So now we got three popes. Three popes. Well, you know, it's all online. Now we got we got people in the hallway. They're watching you, right? And they're I won't say they're laughing. He's waving. He's laughing because he knows you're taking a long time to write. And we're all waiting. For <laughs> now he probably doesn't know that last part. So now, they will call together then, we'll have three popes for a while, and they'll call together another council to try to solve this. This is called the Council of Constance. And Constance is a city further north. It's up near the lake. There's a beautiful lake there. It's up in the mountains between Germany and Switzerland and, and uh, Austria. You get a chance to go see that lake. It's a beautiful lake. And it's a nice place to have a meeting, right? People go out and stare at the lake after a hard day of yelling at each other. And, uh, and it's, they resolve it. They elect a new pope. This time, it actually worked. The other three popes are, you know, decide they resign. They're deposed. But while the council is there, they, they want to meet a lot of the corruption uh, and problems that the churches face, church faces. One of which, of course, is having three popes. So they decide to address other forms of corruption and heresy. Heresy, of course, would be false teaching. So they call to a meeting a guy by the name of John Huss, or Jan Hus. It might be the way he said his name. John Huss, he gets a call. John Huss lives from 1374 to 1415. He was the chancellor. He lives in what we would call the Czech Republic today, but what they called at that time Bohemia. Right? Bohemia. And he was actually the chancellor of the University of Prague. So he was not a, uh, a renegade, he was not a rebel. But he had been criticizing the church for a variety of reasons. So he gets an invitation to this meeting. I don't know what he was thinking when he got it. He thought, oh, great. I think what he was thinking is, great, they're finally paying attention. They're finally going to try to solve the corruption that I am pointing out. And they want me to come and discuss this at this church council where they're trying to root out corruption. So he goes from Prague all the way here to, to, you know, what would be in, near Switzerland, and he goes to this meeting. When he enters the town, uh, he enters the town, he, you know, he, he has high expectations. Because this church, he had criticized the church for its corruption, he had criticized the church for the power of the papacy and how it had been abused, he had accused the church, uh, accused the church and wanted to see changed, the sale of indulgences. And indulgences were, was basically a document that would allow somebody to get out of purgatory immediately. I think I mentioned in here before the view that they had of the afterlife at this time is that everyone who was a good Catholic was going to go to heaven. But you weren't going to go to heaven immediately because you'd done a lot of bad things which you had not re fully repented of and had a contrite heart for and you hadn't confessed them all and you hadn't done that. So what you would do is you would not go to hell, you would go to a place called purgatory. Purgatory was a place that you don't want to be. But basically everybody was going there except for saints. Saints who had, you know, saints of the church were there. The idea is that there were some people like the saints who had done so much good stuff that there was a pool of merit. It's kind of like, you know, I've been teaching for a long time. There are students every year who get more than the possible points in my class. I take those points, and I put them out in what I call the pool of extra credit. 
They could be transferred to you for a donation, and I'll sign a document. You know, okay. That's sort of the idea. The saints have done so much good stuff, it's out there in the pool of merit, and now can be transferred by this document, which, of course, you obtain by making a donation to the church. That's what indulgence is. So you'd go up to somebody, and normally it was for somebody else, like your granny. You know, your granny. What do you call your granny? Grandma, granny. Grams. I don't know whichever you call her. But you pro I hope you like, you like her. If someday she is departed, you would want to do something to help her. This is the idea, because you know, she made you cookies and stuff. She was nice to you. And so now, if you imagine that you're, you know your grandmother's not perfect, so you know your grandmother's in purgatory, so now you can go and get this document to get her out of purgatory. Won't you do that for your grandmother? Don't you want to help her? You want to see her suffer in purgatory when you can help her out in her time of need? Think of all the times she helped you. Think of all the cookies she baked for you. Think of all the nice things she did for you over the years. Can't you do one thing for her now that she's gone? And so you go and make a donation, you fill out the form, and boom, grandma is up in heaven, no longer in purgatory. That's what, a, that's what a indulgence is. That's what Huss is saying, look, this is an excessive thing. So he goes to the council, he's called there to the council, he comes to express his views, but what happens? As soon as he enters the town, he is arrested and condemned and put on trial as a heretic for criticizing the church. And he is eventually burned at the stake. This is a picture of him. Look over here. See this illustration? See all the wood around him? They're lighting him on fire. They're igniting John Huss. Now this makes a lot of people back in Bohemia very mad because he was well respected, well loved back there. But here he's been burned at the stake. And so this leads to civil wars, fights between those. It's called the uh, civil wars in Bohemia or Czechoslovakia, what we call the one-time Czech Republic. These are the Hussite Wars. They're going to last till 1436. And by the way, John Huss is going to be a hero to somebody we're going to talk about a little later in the class. And his name is Martin Luther. Martin Luther, who tries to... Uh, well, who will eventually separate from the church. But he tries to also clean up corruption in the church. All right? Hmm. Well, let me do at least one more screen here before we go. We've got a couple of minutes. And I've got several screens left, so I might, I don't know, I might save these for next Tuesday. Hmm. All right, we'll just end it here. That's a good place to end it. And then I'll continue this next Tuesday. So you'll have to watch that later to get the rest, what we call the rest of the story. So I hope you have a good weekend. And we'll talk to you later.